I used to work 80 to 100 hour work weeks. People would say, no, you didn't. How did you sleep? I didn't sleep. And I had PTSD from like everything that I went through. How do you go from being in law enforcement as a police officer, an investigator, to making over $12 million and building a multiple eight figure business and thriving in every aspect of his life? I've lived three different lives. Corporate America from the age of 21 to 26. From 26 to 31, I was in law enforcement. I'm living the American dream that my mom always wanted me to live. I had my back against the wall. I cannot rely on just one source of income. I'm either going to do it or am I going to do it? So I did it. Within 60 days, we were able to collect a million dollars. And now an entrepreneurial serial one, managing teams, different companies. Always focus on what is more important to you in any decision. Is it your time or is it something else? If it wasn't for every aspect of my life, if it wasn't for the three different lives that I did have, I wouldn't be the man or the leader or have the success in entrepreneurship that I have today. I want to call it the new American dream. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of Legacy and Billions. Today we have a special guest. I mean, we always have special guests, but this one has an extraordinary story. How do you tell me that you go from being in law enforcement as a police officer, an investigator, to making over $12 million and building a multiple eight-figure business and thriving in every aspect of his life? We're about to dive into the story of my good friend, Paul. Alex, welcome to the show. Chris, how you doing, brother? I'm blessed and highly favored, my man. How are you? Man, I'm doing well, man. Blessed as well. I love to hear it, man. So fortunate to be able to share the space with you here, dive into your story and extract some of the wisdom that you've been able to obtain throughout your life, your experiences, being an, uh, an officer and now an entrepreneurial serial one, managing teams, different companies. So why don't we go ahead and dive in, man? Why don't you share with us kind of the start of the journey? How did it go to, hey, who is Alex? Why law enforcement? And then we'll kind of take it from there. Yeah, brother. So I always tell people that I've lived three different lives. I was a corporate America from the age of 21 to 26. From 26 to 31, I was in law enforcement. I actually worked for the city of Oakland in California, one of the most dangerous cities you can think of. Um, don't ask me why I, pe I picked Oakland, but I just felt like that was the agency for me. And the reason why is because I told myself when I transitioned from corporate America to law enforcement, that I wanted to be a cop's cop. I actually wanted to go help the community that needed it, and that community needed it. Mm. So uh, during that time, when I was uh, between 21 to 26, I was already making six figures in corporate America. I used to work for a chemical company, uh, just doing sales. Uh, I was always very charismatic type of guy. Uh, I loved talking to people, doing presentations. Initially, you know, when everybody's young, what is everybody's goal? to make money, to be rich, right? And that was always on my mind. And I always told my mother, you know, my mother comes from Peru. She was an immigrant. My father from Mexico. Uh, he, he's also Latino an immigrant. gang. I'm yeah, Colombian Latino. Venezuelan. Si, yeah. si, hablo español. Mi gente Latina, viva. Ahí va. <laughs> and uh, they always raised me to work hard, to work hard. And they wanted me to live the standard American dream. And the American dream at that time, uh, what I thought was my American dream, but it was realistically my parents' American dream mm. was, you know, go to school, go to college, get a good career, uh, get a house, get a wife, make some kids, and then just retire and enjoy life in the United States. And for, for a lot of people, that is a great dream. That's a great dream. But I don't know, it's just something inside of me that I always thought, I was special and you know come to find out you know I just didn't know what I was capable of because at that time I had limiting beliefs I wasn't as confident as I am now uh, I wasn't as sure what I wanted to do I didn't think of myself as a leader but ultimately through going through life and life experiences I went through corporate America went through the ranks on there got promoted a couple times and then was able to buy my first property at the age of 22 and then at the age of 26, I finally decided, I was just like, you know what? I don't really care about money anymore. I uh, wanted to just do something different. Sales doesn't really fulfill me. And at that time, I was in a very long a term relationship, a uh, total of seven years actually. And uh, it was a very toxic relationship on top We've of We've all been that. through those, man. Oh man, I mean, it builds you. It builds you, it breaks you down and it builds you up. And I think for any young man 
that's watching this right now or young woman, you have to go through those relationships so you you know what's a good and a bad relationship. So when you meet your person, mm. you're able to go ahead and actually make a decision. You know, success loves speed, man. And just like we were talking about now, you know, I've met my best friend and within a few months, I knew that she's my soulmate. So I was able to go ahead and make a swift decision and put a ring on it, man. That's that's and the way you do it, man. Once you've gone yeah. through those experiences oh, yeah. and you do the healing process and you become the person that's going to attract that soulmate, that other partner, yeah. that's where the magic happens. And we can view those experiences as a gift. So if you're going through that healing journey, take your time. God's timing is perfect. You had to go through that so you can grow through that. And your partner's on the way, just like my man, Paul has already manifested his dream spouse coming in September. So congrats for you. Thank you, brother. Thank you. And no, you're right. It's, it's God's plan. I always Amen. believe that, you know, life's already written and God puts you through, you know, some challenges to just build you up. And if it wasn't for every aspect of my life, if it wasn't for the three different lives that I did have, I wouldn't be the man or the leader or have the success in entrepreneurship that I have today. So, um, to, to get back to the transition of corporate America to law enforcement, at that time I had met my ex's um, cousin and he was a sergeant of police for the San Francisco PD. He told me, hey Paul, you know what? You're a charismatic guy. Uh, you're very customer service oriented. Why don't you become the police? I was like, me, the police? I don't know, man. Like I've always just been afraid of the police since you know I was a young kid. And um, my mother, she always raised me to respect the police. That's it, respect the police, you don't wanna get in trouble. The day you meet the police is the worst day of your life. So just make sure you do everything right. And- uh, Instilling that fear, man. Our yeah. generation, our parents, it was all fear-based. Like, yes. hey, if you do this, you know, they're gonna come after you. And it just makes you think to how we become a product of those beliefs later on. And some people develop bad relationships with money, with women, with men, and. I can go on. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about this, but I just want to add that in there. Oh, no, absolutely. You're absolutely right, Chris. I mean, it all depends on how you were raised and then also the beliefs instilled inside of you as you are a child to adulthood. And uh, I, I really saw it once I became an officer. When I became an officer, I saw kids that were committing crimes. And to me, I've always been a neutral guy, man. I'm a, I'm a nurturer. I'm a protector. Mm. So with me, I always had, uh, you could say, I gave people grace, man. I would go ahead and, and be like, hey dude, like I understand you don't have a mom, you don't have a dad, you don't have to do this. Like you could go ahead and choose a different path that can go ahead and build you up for better opportunities. You don't have to be like your friends out there committing crimes. But when you're a kid, and just imagine you're an eight to 10 year old kid in a city like Oakland, in a really bad environment, gang infested, drug infested, and you don't have any means to live or even have food in your fridge, what other option do you have but to go out there and steal and rob and yeah. possibly commit murders? Yeah. You know, At the end of the day, they're just trying to survive. Yeah. And I understand that. That's so know? much grace right there. Most people don't have the empathy or the depth to understand and place themselves in somebody else's shoes and really understand where they're coming from. Well, I think that's the number one thing that someone has to understand when they try to go into any of those jobs or careers where you essentially have to go in to that neutral state of mind and have to go and, and be a civil servant. You have to go in there as a neutral party and see the situation. That's why there's a difference between the letter of the law and the spirit of the law. I always went with a neutral opinion on the situation or a person and I would go ahead and actually make the right decision based on what I saw. Can you elaborate on that? The spirit of the law and the letter of the law? Yeah, correct. Enlighten me with that. I've never heard that before, but it sounds intriguing. <laughs> yeah, so the spirit of the law is essentially you are enforcing the law, but with certain laws, let's say for example, how they legalize marijuana nowadays. If you're under 28.5 ounces, um, it is considered an infraction or a misdemeanor, okay? The law might have changed since I've now been a former police right. officer for the past four years, but back when I was the yeah. police, that was either or, either infraction or misdemeanor. So the officer's discretion was based on how they would go ahead and put the either misdemeanor or infraction on the person they caught with that ounce of marijuana. Yeah. And back then, the officer even had discretion to go ahead 
and actually destroy the actual uh, marijuana, but keep it for safekeeping, write the report, and then give a ticket, and now the person can go ahead and go about their day. They just yeah. have to pay a fine. Or depending if that person, let's say, for example, they got caught with a combination of a firearm or a combination of committing a crime, now they can also put that misdemeanor on that that the actual person so it's basically discretion mm. okay and um with the letter of the law it is you are going by the book mm. and that's why the term hey they threw the book at that person right mm. that's where they got that term from it's uh by it's the basically book. saying by the book as simple gotcha. as that yeah. man not to complicate things got gotcha. you but yeah i i've always been the type of guy that you know i i have a big heart and uh, I can feel that, man. Yeah, I, I can feel that. I always look at the best for people. I always try to bring out the best of people, try to rise people up, no matter who they are, because I don't know what that person might be going through that day. And that's the that just that's the way I've always been, you know. And um, I guess that's why, like, I don't know. I, I believe in karma. I believe in karma. I believe that if you do good good things will happen to you. And that's the way that's always worked for me. I always believe that I've always had angels looked after my back because I've been in some crazy situations, especially what I've done for the past seven years in law enforcement. And uh, it's always worked out for me, man. It's always worked out for me. I just, you know, try to do good, be good, and everything would be good, right? So um, when I talk to my ex's cousin, about being a cop, he was just like, hey, you know, come apply for SF. And I was like, you know what? I think I'm gonna apply for Oakland. And every time I said that to anyone, they'd be like, don't do that. Don't do that. Uh, and it's just because at that time, it was around 2014, um, it was uh, the number one murder capital of the United States. Jeez. And they actually got that streak for a couple of years around that time. And uh, I still did it. I still did it. I was just like, you know what? It, it seems like an honor. And it was because before. of the poverty that was in that area in Oakland, like the environment. Zip code. The, environment. the environment, you know, and uh, come to find out once I was an officer after I graduated from academy and, you know, I started really doing a lot of my due diligence and research, uh, mainly it came from two gangs in that city specifically. For majority of the population, it was actually hardworking community, hardworking community. They just couldn't afford to move out of the community. So when you mm -hmm. think about it, uh, looking from the outside in, uh, you would see hardworking Americans in prison in their own home because you had uh, uh, two groups of, uh, you could say gang members that would just wreak havoc throughout neighborhoods. And it they would just be rival gangs that would always want to shoot at each other or commit crimes. But realistically, for majority of the community, the majority of the community is good people, hardworking people. They're just, unfortunately, they're in their environment and they can't afford to live anywhere else. So being in that environment, I uh, quickly was able to go ahead and actually move up the ranks. Within about eight months, uh, I was volunteered to go into investigations. So I went into investigations, which is called a, a CRT team. And a CRT is the acronyms for Crime Reduction Team. And it was based out of East Oakland, which is, you could say, one of the worst gang-infested areas in the city of Oakland. And the reason why they put me there is because, number one, how I am. Um, I not only show people the most respect, but I was always so fair and I did a good job. So even if I was to arrest you for the most heinous crime, I would still show you respect. I would still say like, hey, do you need a phone call for your mom and dad? Do you need to tell somebody where you're going? <laughs> Sometimes some of the people that I would take to jail, they would go ahead and they'd be like, man, you're, you're actually pretty nice. They're like, do you mind if you could play the radio? I would play them 106 KML, man, hip hop, uh, an RB on the way to jail. But that's the, the way it was for me. You yeah. know, I was just a stand up guy. Yeah. I just had to do my job. And they were like, hey, man, I understand Espinoza. And people would know me from, from the area and in, in, in the community that I would patrol. And then you could say I was one of the more, you could say, uh, proactive cops. I would start knowing you know, the, the community members. And uh, I would talk to the actual uh, business owners of the community. And they finally got to the point where there was a special task force. 
And it's a special task force. Uh, one of the requirements is estaba hablando español. And uh, I was like, oh, well, I speak Spanish. And they're like, well, do you want to do uh, narcotic undercover work? And I was like, sure. You know, I was uh, still a young guy. I was probably like around 20, 27, 28 when they had that uh, job offering. I was like, sure. So uh, got sent. I was the only detective out of 800 officers to get sent to this 13 uh, person task force and it was under the sheriffs of the county Alameda County and it was uh, called the uh, narcotics task force they were actually featured on Netflix a few years back that's sick. Uh, yeah it was pretty cool and um, think about a combination of 21 Jump Street and uh, back in the day Fast and Furious Paul Walker going undercover and he does raids mm. it was a equivalent of all that mixed together. Wow. Um, and it was uh, basically, I would, I, was, I would say the misfits because everybody always had, it's like, they were just happy. They were happy, you could tell they were charismatic. I felt like I'm, I met my tribe. And we all just meshed well, we worked as a team well, we all had each other's back. And uh, we were just going under, under undercover operations where we would tackle uh, large narcotic traffickers. And we're talking about anywhere between millions of dollars of cocaine, heroin, meth, uh, also with high capacity assault rifles. I mean, big, big, big cases. And no one would know what was going on, but I would go and visit my parents and be like, so what happened today? And I would tell them like, yeah, so you know, I just flew on a two man plane, followed this guy all the way to LA and uh, we busted him with you know, millions of dollars of cocaine and recovered a couple million dollars and now I'm here eating dinner with you guys. And they'll be like, oh my God, that's like the movies. It's so amazing. Later on, I find out during my law enforcement career, my mother tells me and she's just like, hey, I never told you this. The day you graduated police academy was actually one of the most proudest times of my life. And I was like, why? She was like, because I never told you back in Peru when I was younger, I actually wanted to be a police officer. But back in my age, they wouldn't allow women to be police officers unless you were a celebrity's daughter or a politician's daughter. And look, you became a police officer, not only a police officer, but you are one of the best detectives in your, in your department. And that exact same year, I actually won a top detective for my department. And uh, it, was, it was a great experience, man. But also after that year was one of the worst situations I ever, uh, ever happened to me. And one of the worst situations that ever happened to me was when we actually did an operation where I had, um, initially arrested a cocaine dealer. He came from LA and he got bailed out the same day. Somebody posted his bail for like half a million dollars or something crazy like that. So we still had information that he was still dealing drugs and everything. Okay. And and we found out where he was at and we tracked him down to this hotel. So we went in surveillance, undercover capacity, and um, we saw people coming in and out of this hotel room. And we would have probable cause to go ahead and actually stop these people coming out of the room based on our observation and information. So every time that we would stop a person coming out of these rooms, uh, one person would get stopped with hundreds of thousands of dollars Another person got stopped with pounds of heroin, which wow. uh, at that time we would call black tar heroin, which uh, it looks like wax, but it's heroin, uh, if you've never seen heroin. And um, we're like, wow, like this guy, he's really dealing out of here. And uh, come to find out, we get a search warrant. Uh, we go How undercover. fast does it take to, t to get the search warrant? Is it like in minutes? You're like, hey, we have witnessed in this, this suspicious activity is going down, get us this warrant, is that kind of how it happens? So there's a big difference uh, depending on the case you're working. Usually mm -hmm. for narcotic operations, it could be minutes to hours depending on the availability of judges mm -hmm. because you have to get it approved by a judge. Mm -hmm. And uh, if it's after five, 
that means it's after hours yeah. and you have to wait for the on-call judge to go ahead and approve the warrant. So they have to go ahead and read it. You usually have to either scan it or you have to go where they're at. Mm-hmm. Um, we've had situations where the judges are like at a Warriors game yeah. uh, <laughs> or at a basketball game yeah. front row. And you're like, yeah. hi, judge. Yeah. Like, this is the case. And they're like, OK, so tell me about this. And they're like, you're articulating the entire case to them and they're reading. They're like, OK, you got everything on there. You got your probable cause. OK, cool. Looks good to me. All right, put up your hand. <laughs> and they, they swear you in right there. And boom, they sign it. Now you're good to go. Wow. Um, nowadays, uh, with technology, thank God, uh, you're able to electronically load up your entire warrant. And then, boom, they could just read it from their laptop. And then they can approve it right there and then. So mm-hmm. my method is a little bit old school. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's pretty cool how it works. And uh, you think, like, wow, like... This is nothing like the movies. Yeah. So then uh, once we got the warrant approved, we put on our raid gear. And I remember I was the second person behind my partner. And my partner is the first one actually breaching the door. So breaking open the door to the hotel. How do you select the guy? It's like, yo, you go first. Great question. Yeah. So it's usually the person with the most experience. So mm-hmm. we're all on the task force, but a selected few of us was actually in SWAT. So SWAT is typically they're more trained. They're assigned to a specific uh, group of, of people, whether they're like a PRO, like a patrol rifle officer, or they're, uh, they come from military experience. Sometimes we'll have like Navy SEALs, a special op military folks that join the police and then they automatically get assigned to SWAT Mm. because they already have that advanced training. Mm. So, uh, the, the person, my coworker at that time who was the first one in front of me, he was already trained on SWAT, which is why he was the first one to breach the door. I was second since I was, uh, it was my case. And then, um, once we breached the door, we went in there. And as soon as we went into the hotel room, just to paint the picture for everybody, uh, just think about a, let's say a Motel 6. Very so sp- no Beverly Hills Hotel, it's low key, you would low never. Low key, you would never expect. Very low key uh, motel, um, one bedroom, probably I would say 250 square feet. Very oh, small, wow. very small room. And there's like six, seven of us going with full riot gear yeah. inside this room. So suspect's laying down, and as he's laying down, he's actually inhaling powdered heroin. At that time, we didn't know that it was mixed with fentanyl. So with certain people, drug users, when they use drugs, their bodies are really used to it. Yeah. So they build a tolerance to it. Yeah. Well, with us, we don't, we don't use narcotics. Oh, so you guys sniffed <laughs> so, that in there? So we got exposed to it because he jumped out like an awe. He was just like, what the heck, again? Yeah. Because it literally happened the day that he he got bailed out. Yeah. <laughs> he got hit again. Yeah. And, um, so yeah. So he went uh, straight out of the bail to get to work. Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because typically it's, you know, whenever you see raids, it's typically like a middle guy is the one that gets raided. It's never the head honcho. Usually the head honchos, I mean, it's gonna be traced back all the way back to the cartel. And they're usually very sophisticated, older gentlemen or women Mm. um, that are handling the business. They're never the young guys. Usually the young guys that usually are very flossy, they're like, oh man, I got it like this, or they're driving the $100,000 cars, you know, in the hood or in the ghetto. Um, Those are usually like, your bottom tier drug dealers. Yeah. The real guys are usually grandma, grandpa, yeah. um, based on my experience. Uh, they're usually never in the same place where the dope's gonna be at or the money's at. Right. And they usually have people under like layers. Yeah. So the only way you're able to track the head people in uh, narcotic trafficking is through usually like T3 wires, which is usually like federal level, or uh, we are granted access to do that on a federal level, which on a task force, typically when they do a multi-agency task force, you usually have somebody from like Homeland Security or the FBI or the DEA on that task force, which at that time we did have folks from HSI on our task force. So we were able to do that if we wanted to, but we would always have um, dozens of informants 
uh, <laughs> from everywhere, and we would have cases going on for months. So we were very busy. So during this case, um, he got up in awe. Now remember, the powder. It was yeah. just like, everything went slow-mo. Yeah. And majority of the powder went in the air. And just think about like when you're going in there and let's say you're going into a construction site and you yeah, see all that powder, the dust. sawdust. Yeah. That's exactly the, the way I still remember it. And majority of it landed on my coworker who was the first one through the door. A little bit got on the rest of us. Well, we all got lightheaded, okay? The rest of the guy, you know, searched it. We did a pretty good recovery for like three or four kilos of coke, money, uh, whatever weapons and all that jazz. So it was good arrest. So yeah. we're like, okay, you're, this guy's going away for a long time now. Yeah. Cause he's out on bail doing this. Yeah. What ended up happening in the next few seconds was one of the scariest moments of my life. Um, so first coworker comes back. He's like, Hey man, I'm not feeling good. Profusely sweating. Turns blue, lips purple, uh, fingertips purple. And then all of a sudden they're like, Hey, let's take out the gear. So he starts taking off the gear and within seconds, he just drops to the ground. And he drops to the ground and he's not breathing. And he looked dead. It, like, I still played in my mind, it's like a movie, man. Like, I was just like, I cannot believe I'm going through this. About a month ago, or I would say three weeks roughly, I was shipped out to Quantico to get training at the DEA Academy. And it was for this exact same situation that wow. had to do with fentanyl. Because around 2017 to around 2019, there was a big epidemic with fentanyl overdoses around the United States and in Canada. Narcotic uh, dealers, they were going ahead and they were moving hundreds of pounds of fentanyl and mixing it with cocaine, heroin, and meth because it's cheaper to mix it with that and to sell quantity. So they were making hundreds of millions of dollars off of this product. Yeah. So, what did we do? We had Narcan at that time, which is uh, the actual antidote to go ahead against this opiate. Fentanyl is typically what the medical staff at any hospital will give you to numb you, to go ahead so you don't feel pain when yeah. you're doing surgery. So I did just, some research on it, on fentanyl. It, it was, it's like 10 times stronger than morphine. And yes. you think morphine is like the top, and no. then I was like, there's levels, like fentanyl must get you on, on a different cloud. Yes. So just imagine when it's not regulated. Yeah. And then you inhale it or you go through your skin, man. Yeah. So it took three NARC cans to actually get them back to breathing. And then they shipped them out to the hospital. I remember that day, my lieutenant and my sergeant were like, you're in charge, Paul. I was the youngest detective out of everybody. Everybody had like 10 to 15 years more in law enforcement than me. And people were like, respect because of my actions that day, I was just able to think on my feet. And that's why I always say, I even said this before the podcast, success loves speed. If you have that intuition of what you have to do, it's muscle memory, just do it. Go mm. with your intuition. Mm. God will lead you to the answer. I get goosebumps saying it. Amen. Yeah, that was <laughs> yeah, powerful. Yeah, 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 man. I am enjoying this. I feel like I'm watching a series right now in my head because I grew up from a Colombian background. Yeah. And that is very famous with Pablo Escobar, the mm -hmm. cartel. Yeah. When I was younger, my mom tells me stories of how she used to date guys that were in the cartel and yeah. crazy stories just like this. So to me, I'm like, oh my God, this is so amazing. Yeah, it's um, it's insane, man. It's insane. And not a lot of people like hear this side of when I used to do police work. Um, my stepfather, uh, you know, I was raised by a single mother and my stepfather, he came into our lives when I was like three. And I remember, uh, every time I sit at the dinner table, he's just like, okay, okay, okay. Like, all right, your mom's gone. Tell me, tell me what happened, what happened? Because it got to the point where it was making my mom stress. Even though I was, you know, already a grown adult, uh, I was a, a detective. She knows what type of person I am and the type of person that I am is, I'm a good guy with a big heart that would do anything for anybody. So it'd be, you know, dangerous situations where, you know, if I hear gunshots, I'm running towards the gunshots, man. I'm not going to wait. You know, yeah, I'll call for backup, but I'm going to go. It doesn't matter. That's just the type of person that I am. And, uh, yeah, he loved hearing the stories. He would just be like, oh, man, it's like the, it's like the TV show Narcos, you know, and all that stuff. Because uh, I think during that time, that's, that's when – all Narcos, the Netflix series yeah. was coming out. 
Yeah. Uh, which was, yeah, it was, it was amazing. I was just like, wow, this is like, it's very real. So after that situation happened, I remember going home and uh, let me paint the picture even deeper now. I was making $250,000 as a detective in California for the city of Oakland. Now, for any of you guys listening to this, you're probably like, cops can make that much? One, California is extremely expensive. expensive. I mean, yeah, we're in Miami, but California is crazy, okay? So in order for you to survive during that time, you had to make over $100,000, bare minimum. Otherwise, you were gonna live in poverty. The second thing people don't know is I used to work 80 to 100 hour work weeks. People would have said, no, you didn't. How did you sleep? I didn't sleep. I didn't sleep. And I had PTSD from like everything that I went through. So I would sleep probably three to five hours a night. And that, and to me, that was enough because I was so locked in into yeah. my career and what I was doing. Like, I had so much fulfillment from it. I loved my coworkers. I like, I, it's just the, that was the, my mission that for, for during that time of my life, it was what I was meant to do. But then after that situation, I really sat down and I was just like, what if he would have died? What if I would have died? You know, how would it affect my mom? How would it affect my dad? How would it affect my sisters? How would it affect my, even my ex at that time? You know, and I was sitting there and I was just like, you know, I'm living the American dream that my mom always wanted me to live. I was almost there. The only thing that was left was to get married and have kids, but I had everything else. I had the career, good paying job, you know, uh, success. I had the house, all that stuff. Man. Checked all the boxes. So. Yeah. I checked all the boxes and I don't know. I just. After that, man, it's just, it, something changed. Something inside of me just changed. Like, I don't know, like it was God telling me like, hey man, like slow down, slow down, right? And uh, that's when I decided, I was just like, you know what? I cannot rely on just one source of income. I gotta go ahead and actually build something else just in the event that if I ever do get hurt or if I ever go on medical, medical and for first responders, you don't get 100% of your pay. They cut it down all the way to 60%. And if I, was, if I was able to work overtime, I wouldn't even be able to afford my mortgage. So I really sat back and really came up with a game plan. Well, a few weeks before that incident happened, I actually talked to a really good friend of mine. And that good friend, he would always bring up ATMs, automated teller machines. And uh, very simple business. Basically, concept is you buy the machine, you load it up with your own money, you can load up two to $3,000 inside the machine, uh, then you sign a contract with a uh, processing network that basically gives you the network to the banks, just like a, when you buy a phone, you get Verizon or AT&T, same thing for the ATMs. And then the hardest aspect about it is just finding the location. So then, uh, since I was in sales before law enforcement, I was just like, I could do that. Okay, easy, I could talk to people all day. So I took two weeks paid vacation and uh, put on the old suit, business suit, and I went out there, man, prospected. And with no further knowledge, I was just like, hey, you know, I can offer ATM at uh, no charge for you. It will sustain your business. You'll have cash available for your clients. What do you think? Six locations within two weeks. I was like, yes, this is easier than I thought. And then I went ahead and I signed up a deal with a large ATM company and they locked me in at a three year contract to use their services, which later on I come to find out uh, the only companies that do that are companies that actually want to take residuals from your profits. And I'll tell you that in a little bit, but they were taking roughly about 20 to 30% of my surcharge profits. And that's how you make money from ATMs is by charging the fee. And uh, I didn't know that because I didn't do my due diligence. Mm. I didn't get a mentor. I didn't self-educate myself before jumping into the business. Uh, I did exactly what I did with the police work. <laughs> I was just like, you know what? I think I'll just be a cop. That's just 
I, I think it's an entrepreneurship type of thing to do. You just jump into the fire yeah. and then learn from your lessons. Yeah. And that's exactly what I did. I just learned from the fire and uh, after paying $7,000 to get out of that contract, I never made that mistake again. So um, I got a mentor after my second month. And the reason why is because after my second month, those six locations, only half of the locations actually made me some money. The other half barely made me like 50 bucks. And I was like, what is this, man? Like I felt sick. I was just like, dude, I just invested like over $10,000 on ATMs and I'm barely making any money. Like, what is this? Well, thank God for my mentor. You know, you meet the right people at the right time. And that, that's why I would say like good karma, you meet good people, you change your environment, you talk to people that are already successful that can lead you to the light at the end of the tunnel. And if it wasn't for this mentor, I wouldn't have been able to become financially free within 18 months. And then after growing my ATM business to 30 locations, I was able to cover all my bills. I was able to reduce my work hours, which is super important to this, from 80 to 100 hours to only 40 hours. Hmm. So now I had all this time. I was financially free and all my friends were like, hey man, what are you still doing here? I still had love for the game. I still had love to be a cop. So at this time I was like, I'm gonna transition. I'm gonna go ahead and transition to special victims unit. And that's what I did. So I applied to special victims unit, got in, uh, started working on a couple of different assignments on there from domestic violence to human trafficking to uh, sexual assault, like everything across the board. So I learned a lot within a couple of years. Uh, those were my last two years there. But then, after I would do my work, I was like, hmm, let me jump back on Facebook. Mind you, okay? I wasn't on social media for eight years. I wasn't on social media since MySpace. Major throwback. Major throwback, right? And I was like, well, let me jump on Facebook. I never, let me reactivate my account after this long. Reactivate my account. And I was in awe. The reason why I was in awe because I was like, this is a completely new world to me. Now you have successful entrepreneurs that were teaching people how to become successful. So in my mind, I was just like, dude, what's the point of going to college now? You know, if you got these successful people teaching you how to become successful, this cuts the curve. Like I was a believer since day one, since I saw it in there. And then Zuckerberg, man, they, they retargeted me. So I got a book ad and the book ad was uh, for digital millionaire and it was by uh, this author named Dan Henry. Dan Henry, He's millionaire secrets. Yeah. yeah. And, um, remember I read the book. I read it eight times, man. Eight times. And you were like, is this for real? Yes. I was like, is this for real? And if you guys never heard about the book, so in the book, it's actually pretty good. I'll give you a quick summary about it. Basically, Dan Henry was a bar owner. He uh, learns Facebook ads, successfully runs leads to his bar. Then he gets hit by the IRS for like $250,000 because he made too much money. And then he had to figure out how to come up with that money within a short amount of time. So then he figured out that if he can successfully run Facebook ads, why doesn't he just go ahead and teach people how to run Facebook ads? So he did a webinar and then he made $45,000 in one hour from the webinar, which completely changed his life. And then he became a multi-digital millionaire within a couple of years. I was just like, wow, that is amazing. Yeah. I was like, dude, you taught people a skill set that gave value to someone else, but then made money for teaching them that skill set. Life changing. Yeah. So then I'm explaining this concept to all my coworkers and they're like, that sounds like a scam. Essentially, I was the, the outlier. That goes back to the limiting beliefs. Exactly, the man. The paradigm, the upbringing. Environment, limiting beliefs. Majority of my coworkers thought we had it made already. Remember, it goes back to the American dream. The American dream at that time for my parents and for a lot of my coworkers was we had the career. We were cops. We were detectives. We were, we were it, you know? No one, we're unstoppable, right? We're on top of the food chain. Little did I know, man. I'm like, whoa, I just opened a can of worms. So I go ahead and I jump on a consultation call and I, with one of his consultants. And I remember him asking me specifically, so Paul, what are you good at? 
And I was just like, I only know two things right now, man. I could show anybody how to be a cop and how to successfully pass like the process to be a cop. Cause I knew at that time, thousands of people applied and then they would never apply again. So I think that would be a great concept. But at that time, BLM was happening, the protests were happening, all that jazz was happening. And I was just, he was just like, nah, that's not a good idea. I was like, yeah, you're probably right. <laughs> so what else are you good at? Well, I um, was able to build a side hustle. He's like, with the what? ATMs. He was like, really? I was like, yeah. He was like, why don't you just teach people that? I was like, you think that'll work? Yeah, why not? You can successfully teach people how to use ATMs, man. Why not? I was like, okay. So... $10,000 later, I remember when I actually self-invested into my first ever program, $10,000, which is a huge investment at that time. I told myself, I sat in my car in front of my house and I was just like, if I don't make this money back, I can blame no one but myself. Ownership. Ownership, man, extreme ownership. And that's what I teach my mentees, that's what I teach my employees. That's what I teach everybody, even my fiance. I was like, babe, we have to take extreme ownership of this. It's only, it's within our reach. We can, we can do this, you know? And that's one of the main reasons why we mesh together because she loves that I like to lead. And a hundred percent, I want to add something to the audience. Now you see why you got to pay a financial investment for your future. Because when you engage in that transaction, you're letting the universe know you're showing yourself that you are a hundred percent committed to getting the results in this process, which is why investing into yourself is a key to unlocking your future, right? As uncomfortable as it might be in that moment, I'm sure you probably had never done a $10,000 investment into a program, into a coach or into a course no. at that time, but just let me take a risk because I believe that it's possible yeah. and I'm willing to put in the work. And so boom, you invested into yourself. You got into the course. Yeah, skin in the game, man. Skin uh, in the game. I always tell people you gotta have skin in the game because when you think about it, right, the psychology behind it, whenever you give somebody something for free, how much do they value it? All the answers are already online. Exactly. A lot of people say, I could go to YouTube. I could find it on Google. Okay, if that was the case, why haven't you done it already? There's no self accountability. Now, let's say you invest $10,000 and then you tell everybody, hey, I just invested $10,000. They're gonna say like, so what did you do with it? Let's say months, a year later, well, nothing. They're gonna say, why? You just invested that $10,000. Why did you lose that money? That is your own fault. That is your own fault because you have the roadmap, you have the blueprint right there. There's someone successful that is trying to help you. And one thing that I did, why I read that book, why, why it, 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 it just talked to me, man. Because the author, he was just a regular dude. He's just a regular guy. He's a regular man like me. Regular human. We're all regular humans. Well, it separates us from great and people that are doing bad in life is your limiting beliefs is your self-worth. Hmm. How much are you worth in this earth? Are you willing to invest all you can to make yourself better? And that's the way I see it, man. That's you know, powerful. I've invested over a million dollars in the past three and a half years. Courses, programs, mentors. My latest mentor right now, I just came back from Idaho, is Russell Brunson. It's me, Russell, and 19 other entrepreneurs from around the world. Two days, we just, we're around our people. What do I mean by that? People that have so much self-belief that we could change the world. Yeah. And that's what it's about. Yeah. It's about being uncomfortable. Yeah. I'm actually happy. I'm, I could say I'm one of the poorest millionaires in that group. Because mm. it's very humbling, number one. Yeah. But number two, it now gives me a goal where I want to be at in the next three to five years, man. And it's somewhere where I never thought I would be, even back when I was in uniform. I thought I was doing it already, man. So good. Yeah, dude, it's, it's crazy how life can just build you up. Yeah, read the book and uh, invested the 10,000. That was April of 2020. 
Now let's get to the good stuff. <laughs> September of 2020, I make my first thousand dollars. I built the ugliest website known to man with the weirdest name. It was called 30 day ATM biz. That just goes to show <laughs> progress over perfection. You don't need to have the perfect website, ebook, funnel strategy. You just got to get started and you got to fail your way into success. Yes. No, you're absolutely right. I remember doing my first uh, ad for Facebook. I would stutter like a hundred times, like literally just with a black marker would write my ebook on there, like free uh, 10 steps on how to build a successful ATM business and didn't have any lighting, didn't have a setup like this, um, bought like a $20 mic from Amazon and just went to work, man. And I just spent hours upon hours upon hours trying to figure it out during COVID. Hmm. And I remember people talking behind my back, like close friends, even family members, which sucks, but it is what it is. Um, saying like, what, does he really think that people are going to buy this during COVID? You know, and it just goes down to limiting beliefs again. Right? So September of 2020, make a thousand dollars. And I was pretty pumped. I was pumped, but I'm very competitive. That's, that's, I, I just have it in me, man. I'm very competitive. And I was like, I could do better. There's these guys online that they say they're clearing a hundred thousand dollars, doing a million dollars a month. I mean, they're, they're just average guys like me. You know, we all bleed, man. We all bleed. So I could do it too. Si se puede. And si se um, puede. I remember October of 2020, $3,000, November of 2020, $5,000, December of 2020, $6,000. And I remember on my mom's birthday on January 15th, I took my first call and this is after I refined my offer. I changed the name. I changed the look. I changed the hook. I changed everything, the look of it. I remember drawing the logo put it on my wall, going on Fiverr, having an artist just make the logo. And I was like, this is it. This is gonna be awesome. And what I found out after some market research and then after failing a few times and making only a little bit of money, but keep going, keep going, keep building, keep building, keep believing, that majority of entrepreneurs that were looking into that industry, the number one problem they had, the number one pain point that I could help them out with was actually providing locations for them and providing the sales training for them. So what I did is I came with the concept of building a business in a box where we include the ATM, we include the location, we include the network, we include everything and they get coaching directly from me. Mm. I remember I pitched the first entrepreneur. He was from the military, still a client to this day. He actually joined my second company as well. And, uh, he goes, this was the shortest sales call I've ever had. It was 15 minutes. And he goes, all right, so what do you, what do you have to offer? I was like, sir, um, so this is a brand new offer. I haven't even wrote it out yet. But uh, I, I think I'm going to call this, uh, it's called the ATM Together Package. And um, we're going to include your ATM. I'm going to give you a location. We'll find it for you. I, I, I set up a call center. Um, and uh, we'll help you set up everything. We'll get you up and running within 30 days. Sounds good. How much? And I was like, I didn't even have a price. I didn't even have a price. I was like, all right, well, let me look at the overhead. Did the math real quick. Okay. Overhead. All right. Okay, sir. $6,000. I'll get it all done for you. Okay. Let's do it. Do you accept MasterCard? I was in awe. I was in awe. I was like, wow. I cannot believe I just made my first high ticket sale and it was two hours before my mother's birthday dinner and i was like i was like okay gotta go and i remember i was telling my mom at her dinner i was just like mom i just sold like my first package for six thousand dollars yeah and she's like oh that's good but see the thing is you know my parents at the time they didn't really understand they still don't understand the internet like that uh, they understand TikTok, of course, but they don't understand the internet like that. It's still how it works and everything. So to them, they're still getting used to all this, even though it's like four years later. And um, 
I remember she was like, oh, that's good, that's good. So how's work, by the way? Because remember, she always wanted to be a police officer. So that was the most important to her benefits, stability, you know. Uh, living her, beliefs. Living beliefs. And um, I went ahead and just ramped up from there, man. So had my first 30K month, then 70K month, and then March of 2021. <sighs> After six months of sleeping three hours a day, waking up at 4 a.m. to wake up at 5 so I could talk to my East Coast clients and take consultations all the way up to 11 a.m. Pacific Central Time, then go work out for one hour, go to work, my shift would end at 11 p.m. at night, go home, get a few hours of sleep. I generated $120,000 as a solo entrepreneur from my online business. In a month. In a month. And I remember going back to work that night at the end of that month and I go back to my coworker. I'm like dude you never guess how much I generated this month and at that time it was 70% net profit margins man it was amazing I was like this is such a game changer I don't know what to do should I quit should I continue like what should I do and uh I remember I, first person I actually asked was my mom because I have a very close relationship with right. my mom. I was like, mom, I made $120,000 for my business. And she goes, oh, yeah, yeah, that's nice. Right? And I was just like, do you think I should quit my job? No. And she, and she goes, no. How dare you? No, no, no. She's like, no, 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 no. Unless you're making a million dollars a month, don't quit. And I was like, a million dollars a month? <laughs> I was like, I'm not even making, I'm not even making uh, 120 just base salary. I have yeah. to do overtime to make what I make now. Yeah. And, uh, and she's like, no, the benefits. Like, remember the benefits. You know, that's all she worried about. The benefit, Kaiser, it's the best medical plan. You know, state covers everything. And I was like, damn, mom. I was like, all right. It's crazy to think for where we come from as a Latin. Yeah. Since we're coming to the States to fulfill that American dream and we come from, you know, almost nothing, right? Yeah. That's scarcity. Yeah. It's like you got to hoard, you got to. You got to be greedy, right? To protect, to be able to feed the people in your immediate circle, in your family. And you got to stuff it up until you don't know when you're not going to have again. And it's always that scarcity mentality where we come from. So it's all about st security, yeah. stability. How can we be in the safest place possible? And sometimes the people that we love the most will go to for advice because we highly value them, but they're not they're going to give the wisest advice. So at that moment, you had to make a decision for yourself. You said, am I going to go and believe my mom's belief and stick to what I was raised or am I going to forge my own path, build my own name, pursue the dream that you had? And so that's exactly what you did. I believe in the ripple effect, man. I wanted to change the dynamic of my family's generation. So I good. wanted to be the first person to, number one, just say I was the first millionaire in my family, which I am. But not only that, I'm the first multimillionaire person in my family that's dramatically changed. I think in, in the whole bloodline, right? In history. Yeah, in my entire bloodline. And, you know, for my family to just be like, wow, this guy who went from like corporate sales to this and would always say about like, he has these crazy ideas and try to do these side hustles and just try everything and then finally to make it. They're like, they've been there. They've seen it. And it's, it's actually helped like my siblings. Like I have two sisters, a younger one and an older one. They're both registered nurses. They've gone to school. They're the studious ones. I was always the black sheep. Mm. And uh, the younger one, she actually quit nursing to want to live a digital nomad lifestyle, to work from the laptop. Just like you know, a lot of these influencers they talk about, man, online. And she's actually doing it. Good and she's her. making like four times working under one of my organizations doing it. And uh, I remember the first time that uh, she wanted to ask me, she was uh, very hesitant to ask me um, just because, you know, she was studious. She was very proud to be a nurse and, and I get it. And I was proud of them. But uh, she actually went to my mom first. She's like, hey, puedes apuntar por uh, pero trabajar para él? And my mom actually was like, hey, hey mijo, mijo. Um, Tú sabes, uh, tu hermana quiere trabajar para ti porque ya no quiere ser enfermera. 
I was like, she doesn't want to be a nurse anymore. Yeah, yeah. Like she went to school for four years and paid a ton of money to be a nurse. And she makes good money in California. Yeah. You know, nurses, they make like six figures in California. Yeah. So I was like, she wants to like work from the computer. She's like, yeah. Like, can you give her a position like as your assistant or something and like pay her like, I don't know, 250,000 or something. I was just like, mom, that's not the way it works. Like she, she, has, uh, she has to like do sales or something. She has yeah. to prove herself in order to get a position like that. Yeah. So she did, she did. She learned sales for, for a few months and uh, struggled a little bit. And she was like, uh, I remember I would also hear it from my parents. Hey, how come she's not making the type of money you're making? I was like, well, mom, she has to talk to people. Like she has to like actually sell. And uh, she goes and she goes, okay, okay, okay. And then after it was the ripple effect. I mentor her, she started getting used to sales and now, man, her life completely changed. And the way she thinks, the way she analyzes life is completely different. And I think that's powerful, man. If you're able to change the dynamic of someone's life just by you just being nice to them or like just showing them grace, man you can dramatically change somebody's view. And I feel like I've changed thousands of people's view by leveraging social media. Mm. Now, in full transparency, I'm not a big fan of social media for personal reasons. The reason why is because I like to stay present. I think talking to people like this, like how we're talking right now, is very powerful. It actually changes you as a person to actually know how to have soft skills. And I feel like that skill in itself, especially in 2024, it's actually becoming a very special and perishable skill. Because if you look at the most successful people, what are they good at? Communication. If you're able to communicate, you're able to be a great storyteller. You are the one that controls the narrative in the world. That's the reality of the game. Powerful. Man. If you look at it, Steve Jobs, he was a great communicator. That's why people followed him. He wasn't the one creating the tech in the background. He was the one with the vision. And that's what I am, man. I'm a visionary guy. I'm a startup guy. I come up and I start little fires and then I hire people that are smarter than me. And then they handle business and then I go do it again. And that's how I've been able to create three businesses. First with the ATM, I brought into the online world. Since year to date, that company generated $24 million. We've helped over 3,000 people change lives, man. And then um, connected with a lot of other uh, influential entrepreneurs that were experts in their field, got into merchant services, which is credit card processing. Connected with uh, two guys out of Los Angeles, California that had over 18 years of experience with credit card machines. And uh, off of their concept, they were like, Paul, we love what you did with ATM together. We think we can build something great and change the world. Uh, within credit card processing. And I was like, all right, man, pitch me. And I remember them pitching me at the restaurant we went. We went to, uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with this restaurant, it's called Javier's in California. It's a really good Mexican restaurant. If you're in California, the OC or in, in uh, La Jolla in, in San Diego. And we're there, we're eating. And I remember them pitching me and they're like, imagine if you were to help every mom and pop shop in the United States wipe out 100% of their credit card processing fees. And I was like, what do you mean, dude? They're like, did you know that these big banks, Chase, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, Clover, all these massive companies, business owners, like your mom, like your dad, they'll go and they'll open a business. Let's say they want to open a little taqueria or something, or a cafe. They'll go to the website, they'll go to the bank. Little do they know, they're gonna get charged hundreds to thousands of dollars in credit card processing fees. Well, I knew this, you know this, why? Because we use merchant services. One of the biggest ones is Stripe, Stripe. right now, right? They usually charge us 2.7%, right? For every unit that they sell. Well, we sell through them. So it's a big business, it's a billion dollar industry. Yeah. And I was like, how do you wipe out the fees? And they're like, simple, my man. Cash discount program, how does it work? Well, the way it works is, now, instead of the merchant, the small business owner taking on the fees, all they're doing is they're giving their client the option. Think about it like this. Back in 2020, when COVID changed the world, it changed the world for good and bad. Good because certain companies that really looked at the entire picture, what is selling? Convenience. Now everything is convenience. It's about speed. 
If you're able to make your product faster, easier, simpler, you're gonna win in any industry. He's like, and that's what you did with ETM together. You were able to help thousands of entrepreneurs that were never gonna start their business, but because you gave them the light of hope, they came to you. They came to you because they resonate with you, because they like you. They didn't just buy the program. They bought you. They bought you, man. And I was just like, dude, I never thought about it like that. Mind you, these guys are in their 50s, so they have more experience than me. That's why I always stay a student of the game. Mm. It doesn't matter at what level I'm at, man. Yeah. Even billionaires have mentors. Yeah. So if I want to get to that status, I have to keep learning. Yeah. And that's why self-education is key. The last investment I did, I spent over a million dollars in self-education in the past few years. But the last investment I did was $150,000. And that's if that that went from me investing that first ten thousand dollars. Imagine the jump. Yeah. How much self belief I have in myself because I know it's not about what I'm gonna get. It's about the information that I'm gonna get access to. If you're able to get access to this information, you're able to get proximity to the people that know the best. That's what you want to be. You want to be in the room with those people that make you uncomfortable. That's why I said I'm the brokest millionaire. But guess what? I'm a millionaire. Hell yeah. Yeah, man. So it's amazing, so dude. Good. It's amazing. But with the um, credit card machine, just to finish up, you give the customer the option to pay with cash, then they don't get charged a fee. If they choose to pay with a credit card, then they get charged the credit card processing fee. So essentially, you're just switching it on the client. Number one objection, I even said this. I was just like, well, aren't merchants going to lose clients? Think about it like this. How many people got used to paying Uber Eats $50 for a hamburger? Did they lose clients? No. They're a multi-billion dollar company. Yeah. Man, everybody is charging fees now. People got used to it because it's faster, easier, and simpler. Same thing's happening with mom and pop shops. Why? Because the digital world has affected the economy. The digital world has affected inflation. So now the brick and mortar uh, shop owners, the brick and mortar mom and pop shops, they have to go ahead and really look at what their overhead expenses is. So more people are going to want to go ahead and use this specific program. And I asked them specifically, what's the percentage of businesses around the world or around in the United States that is using this? He said less than 5%. And you know what that means for you and me and for you watching right now? <laughs> Opportunity. Yeah. Opportunity. It's a big blue ocean. Meaning that in business, that is a big, big opportunity that anyone can take advantage of. If this opportunity was available first when I started entrepreneurship, man, oh, dude, it would have been amazing. But now I'm still happy that I'm a part of it. Yeah. You know, within one year, we had launched a company in February of 2023. I met them in December of 2022. Launched it in February 2023. And a year to date, we're at $6.3 million dollars in that company wow. okay complete startup yeah i stepped away from my main company atm together and i told my coo i told him hey bro i'm gonna do this startup by myself i think i could do it i'll be back in 90 days so i did it within 60 days we were able to collect a million dollars um we were able also to obtain 80 locations that use the the device and we had extreme success with client testimonials, which is huge. Yeah. I always tell my clients, your success my is my success. success. And it goes back to karma. It goes back to karma. You know, I was on, on, on another podcast where uh, I got asked a question. They're like, what do you think about these, these people online that, you know, they're scamming people out of money, especially online and self-education. I was just like, do your due diligence, market research. You know, you have the online space where you could go ahead and look at the reviews, talk to somebody who's used their services, see what the results are. And if they're for you, they're for you. But at the end of the day, you could typically tell based on the information that they're going to provide you, the way they speak, their background and everything, if they're trustworthy or not. At the end of the day, I'm not going to ruin my livelihood or my family's livelihood for one deal. Um, so when we launched that, and I, for, I can't believe I forgot this portion of the story, man, but you're gonna love this. I love to help people. Back when I put my two weeks when law I left in law enforcement, okay? This was back in probably quarter two of 2021. 
I put it in my two weeks. The only reason why I did it, I had one friend. I had one friend who just got promoted to sergeant at the time, he's youngest sergeant. And I was just like, dude, how do you become a sergeant? Like, that's amazing. And I remember we're sitting in the office and uh, I had told him, he was one of the guys I told him, I, dude, I just made 120,000 from this, you know, uh, digital marketing company. And he's just like, leave. He's like, leave. He was the only person that told me to leave. He was like, dude, leave, grow it. You could do it, bro. He's just like, dude, you, you're on it in law enforcement. Why wouldn't you be on it in business? You're a great leader. And it took that one person to give me that small push. And that's what we need in life. Sometimes we need that one person to just mm. believe in you, to give you that push. And now I'm such a big believer in that. And the reason why, because if I never would have invested the first $10,000 into that program, none of this would have ever happened. And think about how powerful that is. It's not that I risk $10,000, it's actually that I risk $30 million by potentially not investing that $10,000 in the very beginning, a few years ago. And that's how powerful self-education is. Even reading one book can change your, your life. Even meeting one person can change your life. One I'm, podcast can change your life. <laughs> yeah, no, dramatically, dramatically. And just like we said, you know, um, me, myself, I started doing a, a self-help podcast, but you asked like, what, what gave you the idea of doing a self-help? Because we all need it, man. We all need it. You know, my mother, she raised me to be a strong man. And she was a single mother, she's a strong lady. I love her to death. She's a tiny little thing. Chihuahua with a lion's voice, Latina. Hmm. And uh, I used to listen to this podcast that was self-help every single time I would commute to work as a police officer. I was like, people really need this, man. People need motivation. People need to be optimistic. People need to be thankful for life because it can always be worse, man. There can always be worth. I have two hands, two feet. I can talk. We're all blessed. We're all blessed to have what we have in life. And that's why I tell you, take advantage. Life is short. You never know when things will change. You just got to take control of life and do what you can. It's God's plan, man. Amen. But, um, yeah, so with the credit card processing, the COO, okay, to finish off with this, he was actually that friend that told me to leave. He helped me build ATM together. When he was helping me build ATM together and I told so him- So you ended up recruiting him. I recruited him. He was him. the one person that believed in you. Yeah. And then you were like, yo, I got something special for you. I had ended up leaving the department. I sold my house at that time. I lived in the best neighborhood in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, I sold everything. And I, and I said, this is gonna be a new life. I'm gonna sell everything. I'm gonna move away from where I'm comfortable from. I'm gonna move to San Diego. I didn't even know nobody in San Diego. I just loved San Diego because I used to get sent over there for training as a detective. And I loved the beach. So I wanted to get inspired every morning. And I wanted to wake up and just get the ocean breeze, man. So I got a, uh, a penthouse near the, near, the, near the beach. And I would every morning I would wake up, man. I'd just see the sun and I'd just be like, Thank you, God, for like another day. Like, like I'm super blessed. And like, I just felt the energy, man. The energy was there. And people feel the energy when they're around me. You know, everybody that I've employed, like, they're like, dude, I love working here. And I'm like, why? They're like, because the culture is so different. And year to date, man, I've employed over 60 employees. I've only lost two. And those two is just because, unfortunately, they didn't have the work ethic, but I gave them chance after chance. I was like, come on, man. Yeah. Like, I'm the coolest boss. You like, can't save just, them all. Just do your job, please. And, you know, they forced me. But other than that, you know, it's almost unheard of, especially in this, in this, uh, in this realm of business. And um, that one friend, when I went to San Diego, uh, business was booming, man. Business was booming. And uh, I told him, I was like, hey, man. So I know you get paid pretty good to be the police. Um, what if I paid you four times? I was gonna say, but what if we paid you triple? <laughs> <laughs> what if I paid you four times what they're paying you? Would you come? And guess what? You don't have to worry about rent because you could just stay here in my penthouse. I got like an extra bedroom for you. He's just like, yeah. So uh, he came, dude, and it was the best time just building a startup company. We were just having fun, man. Like just living it up in San Diego. 
uh, building a company, making money, changing lives, just talking to people, learning. He was able to get mentored, completely changed his life, his way of thinking, um, just absolutely everything. And then um, when we got to our second year with the first company, and I separated myself to go build a second company, which is called Merchant Automation dot com uh i had told him i was like hey you're gonna take my responsibilities as ceo and you're gonna run everything revenue still went up which i was like good job dude because of that i pour into people i believe in people i invest into people and that's what i say i don't i don't care about money i'd rather invest into people good people so i told him the second company bro because you helped me build this first company up, I'm gonna make you a co-founder, 50-50. Wow. That's... Yeah, 50-50, I'm not gonna give you no 10%, no 1%, no, 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 50-50, bro, because that's the type of person I am. So then we built it up. Um, I worked on it as CEO for a year, um, all last year, and then finally he transitioned to CEO last month, uh, took it over, completely changed his life, I mean, the guy makes 10 times more than he ever did in the police department. Uh, Multi-millionaire digital marketer now. Um, now he could literally write a book <laughs> on, on his, just his experience. Um, and I recruited another fellow who comes with 12 years of experience. But to keep it short, it just shows you, man. When you do good by people, and you do good things and you provide good business and good values and you're just a good person overall, good things will happen in your life. And that's what keeps happening. I pull in good people that are leaders that want more in life. And that's the strong belief system that I have. I have such a strong belief system, not only in myself, but in everybody, dude. I see the best in everybody. I see that. Yeah. And I like to be around good people in good environments because it's just gonna take you to the next level. 100%. And that, that's just the way I am, man. But overall, dude, you know, if it wasn't for that first $10,000 investment, if it wasn't in believing myself, if it wasn't for the life experiences that happened to me in my life in law enforcement and corporate America, the way I was raised, I mean, I wouldn't be here, man. I wouldn't be able to do none of this. I always get asked the question, especially from younger folks, how do you find the money to invest into your first business? I, I say, keep it simple. Just find a job, a retail job, a job that's gonna show you some skills, some basic skills. Great advice. Because being online, not interacting with other humans are not gonna show you the same skill sets that you're gonna need when you're actually talking to people in real life. Hmm. That's what you need, soft mm, skills. Just so good, man. You need soft skills. You need to know how to talk to people. The number one skill set you can have right now in 2024 for any young person, so for any old person, is actually sales. And if you think about it, every occupation has sales in it. From your medical doctors, to your car salesman, to even the person at McDonald's. Everyone is doing sales. So. If I was 18 again, I would get a commission-based job, learn the ropes of sales, and then get a job that is uncapped, or get a job where you can work as much overtime, save your money, and then invest that money into your passion, what you want to do as a business. That's how you build wealth, not by going ahead and taking a risk without having a job or taking out loans or none of that. Every single business, everything that I built was not handed to me. It all came from blood, sweat, and tears, bootstrapped, meaning that I've invested my own money no into this No outside funding, yeah. yeah. Skin no, in the game. No angel investments, none of that. Everything self-funded, man. Started with nothing. Like I said, ugly websites. I just, imperfect action, I just got it done. That's it. Brother. God bless you, man. You got such a great heart. You're an amazing communicator. You're a great storyteller. You're a hard worker. You're an operator. You're a business owner. You're impacting lives. And you're talking about God, man. It's a blessing to be connected to you and to 
have the opportunity to share this with the audience and the people that are watching this episode, this is just God's plan. If you're watching this, this is a sign for you to take that bold risk, to heal from that toxic relationship, to go get that job if you have to, just so you can fund your passion and to surround yourself with community, the right people, get a mentor, ask for help, but don't stay where you're at. Don't stay stuck because that's going to be very painful one, five, 10 years down the line thinking that, man, I saw this episode. I had that opportunity, but I didn't go for it. That's like what scares me rather than the fear of like, is this going to work out? You know what I mean? So I have a couple of questions to close out. Number one, how did you heal from the toxic relationship to become this wholesome, heart centered, empathetic, people believing individual person that you are today? Speaking to someone. So fortunately for me, I had a small group of friends and, you know, I was very introverted back in my 20s and it was just talking about the situation. When you talk to someone, it is very freeing to go ahead and actually express your pain that you're going through because if you hold it in, guess what? It's just going to build up. You have to let it go. That's why mm. a lot of people, I was like, hey, if you're scared or you're embarrassed to go talk to a therapist, don't be. I've talked to a, ther a therapist. Everybody's talked to a therapist. It's actually pretty normal when you're a first responder and you talk to a therapist. It actually helps you in life. Even if you don't need it, still go talk to someone. You know, communication is key to life. And the more you communicate, the more you express your concerns, your anger, maybe your sadness, the better you're gonna feel about it. That's an amazing answer. Number two, given the fact that you are humbly the, the poorest millionaire in a room full of multi, multi, almost billionaires, Russell Brunson type guys, you practice what you preach, but how do the most successful entrepreneurs make decisions? How do you make those decisions? Because most people are like dabbling between whether I should do it, whether I should not. I learned from Patrick, but David, successful people, they're decisive. They just fail forward. They make that decision and that's what builds leaders. Because people are like, hey, what do we do here? It's like, you got to make that decision. So how do you make decisions? So I'm a big believer in what I like to call is needle movers. Depending okay. on what you're trying to make a decision, is it going to move you forward towards your goal that you are trying to accomplish? It, if it is not, then more than likely it's not the right decision to go with. In business, it's very simple to go ahead and make a decision because you're either going to make more revenue or it's going to cost you more time. What is more valuable mm. to you? In life, what I know, time is everything. Time is the new rich. So what I always tell people is always focus on what is more important to you in any decision. Is it your time or is it something else that you think is important? which is why you invest 10, 100, half a million dollars into collapsing time by getting the blueprint, the answers, the knowledge transferred directly to you through a mentor. Correct. And so how do you build an exceptional company culture? I used to work for Patrick Bed David and I love the company culture, but I want to hear from another fellow entrepreneur to having and fostering 60 employees, having only two quit, that's phenomenal. So how do you go about building a company culture? Leading by example. Oh, perfect. So everything that I have built was with my two hands. Now, if you remember a few moments ago when I was saying I would get three hours of sleep, but then I would wake up at 4 a.m., I would wake up at, 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 uh, to have, do calls at 5 a.m. to talk to my East Coast clients, uh, take a certain number of calls, and then go to work as a full-time detective, and then go do it all over again for almost six to seven days a week for six months. For a lot of people, most people are not willing to do that. <laughs> but for me, I had my back against the wall. I had to say, I'm either going to do it or am I going to do it? And it has to work or it has to work. And I wasn't going to let anything stop me. So it's that limiting belief that you have to get rid of. You have to believe in yourself that you can do it. And even if you have to suffer a little bit, it's okay. Mm. It's not going to last forever. It's only a short, short term pain. You can surpass this. And also my employees, they appreciate 
the fact that I still, even at my level, I still talk to the entry level guys. I still treat them like they're my friend. But when it comes to business, we're in business mode. And that's the difference. I'm just very transparent. You have to be a great communicator and you have to motivate your people. How do you motivate your people as a leader in your organization as a CEO or a founder? You have to share your vision. You have to go ahead and tell them, this is what's coming up, guys. This is how I'm being productive to produce more revenue for the business to feed you and your family. What I need from you guys is to go ahead and actually produce because whether you guys want to be the next CEO or whether uh, one of you guys want to be the next founder, it's up to you guys. The only person limiting themselves is you. A majority of my employees are on commission. So they know it's uncapped. I want them to make more money. You know why? Because a flex to me is how much I pay my employees. Mm. That's, that's the true flex. To say like, oh yeah, I got a couple employees that are already millionaires. That's the biggest flex ever. And how many people I could help. I could care less about material things, man. Material things, it doesn't matter. Been there, done that, had the fun and all that jazz. And at the end of the day, it's about helping others. One of the things as you were sharing with me this, con this, um, this insight was that you said you can talk to them as friends, but when it's business, it's business. How do you develop that frame of mind to get into the business mode, take care of that, and then also cultivate that relationship outside where they're comfortable, they can joke with you, they can have fun? How do you, go, how, how do, you do that? Well, it just comes with delegation. Um, since I come from the law enforcement world, it's very paramilitary. So at the end of the day, I delegate all the responsibilities that I will look after to my supervisors. So COOs, CFOs, uh, CMOs, and then they go ahead and they delegate to the employees. Now, when it comes to responsibilities, they are the ones that have to go ahead hold and actually hold them accountable. If, I, if they have to hear from me, someone's in trouble, unfortunately, so they know not to come directly to me. That way, I could go ahead and actually be the motivator. I could be the good the parent. The nice guy, yeah, yeah. The, good, the yeah, nice guy, yeah. and that's how we work it, you know? Yeah. All right, you're the bad guy, I'm the nice guy. And that's how, how it is. Unless I call you for a meeting. Yeah, no good. <laughs> it's not good, right? And that's the way it should be. It yeah. should be some uh, organization in the ranks, right? Yeah. Nobody should really be talking to the CEO unless the CEO is approaching them. Um, and the same thing was in the police department. Nobody would really talk to the chief of police unless you were in trouble. Yeah. So same, Badges. same, <laughs> same mindset we brought into business, man. Wow. So that played a huge role in your organizational structure and your discipline, your delegation, the teamwork, the vision. Oh man, it did. I've had such a good time getting to know you and your story. And we'll do one more question. Yes. What is the vision for you next five, 10 years? Well, maybe two questions. And then how do you want to be remembered when you're not here anymore? Oh man, that's, that's a phenomenal question. Uh, so next five, so personal goals right now, um, marriage, family. I want to have a big family, to be honest. So you have to build wealth in yeah, order to have yeah, a lot yeah. of kids. I, I mean, you've done it right. Yeah. <laughs> you've, you've definitely played your cards right. Yeah. So, um, that, that was always me, man. Like my, my mother, she always, um, drilled stability and, uh, financial freedom. And I took those traits as a, as a kid. And I was just like, you know what? I want to get married, but only after I know I could take care of my wife after I know I could take care of my kids and be the provider as a man. So now at this stage of the game where now I could not have to work like 80 to hundred hour work weeks anymore. And I have employees, I have supervisors that can do that for me. And I'm able to go actually spend some family time together. Yeah. Now it's time. Now it's my time to go ahead and get married and have kids. So that's personal. Now, as far as, more with like the general public and my my business and my professional goals and also as just my my i would also include as my personal goals is i want to help more people actually find what they're good at within the digital marketing space um and i've had these conversations with a ton of folks in the past few weeks actually so uh it's a great question but they're like hey so 
you already ran two six highly successful companies in the past few years. What is the point of this third one? Well, the third one was actually a passion project. And the first time I ever told anybody about it was actually at my mentor's mastermind, Russell Brunson's mastermind. And I remember I was like, I was so embarrassed to like tell him, like, I was like, Hey guys. So yeah, I'm, um, I'm, I'm doing this uh, brand new program. Uh, I want to help average people like myself that come from nine to fives that don't know anything about digital marketing. And I want to help them become millionaires online and create offers for them and help them just flourish because I think this will change dramatically people's life because it's still, I believe very new. It's still very new. It's a very new industry. And I remember them telling me like, but why you already have two businesses? Like I, we understand this is a passion project. Like that's what it sounds like. And I was just like, like, what do you want to call it? Well, actually, I want to call it the new American dream because when you remember my story, when I was kept talking about how my mom would say, I want you to have a good career. I want you to have the house, her Benefits. American dream. My new American dream is what I'm living now. Hmm. I'm able to actually work from my laptop. I'm able to have over 60 employees all over the United States and in the world. I'm able to travel anywhere that I would like. My parents can fly here to Miami whenever they want. I could go to California. We could live in another country. Yeah. But here's the thing. We're able to do it remotely. And that's what the new rich wants. And that's what I want to be able to provide mm. to people that don't have access to what I have access to. Because I feel like unless you were born with money, you can't really get access to this information, man. I mean, I just paid a million dollars over the past few years to learn what I know now. Yeah. But I want to be able to provide this for free. Yeah. And that's what I'm doing right now. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, remarkable. So, so I'm going to, I'm going to create a free community. It's going to be free and anybody can learn digital marketing. And you know, essentially if they would want to work one-on-one -on -one with me, yeah. that's when obviously I would have to charge for the time, but it's not about that. It's yeah. just more, I just want to give it all away, man. Yeah. So now I'm uh, coming down to creating my personal brand more, more awareness about self-belief, self-help. I'm a big believer in that, man. I guess it comes from just being in law enforcement, first responder, and uh, just helping others, man, and just making the world better, dude. Because, you know, for some people, the world's a dark place, yeah. and I've been there. Yeah, I've been there. <laughs> 80 to 100 work weeks, man, at least sleeping three hours a day. It, uh, it ages you, okay. <laughs> you know, and it's, it's not good. I wasn't in a good mental space back then. And, um, I want to be, uh, known for being able to help people just through my story. Because like I said earlier today, man, you know, the storyteller is who controls the narrative. And, you know, I've been able to go ahead and progress on my storytelling and just tell my story just better and better with time. And it's just because I'm growing still as an adult, as still as a man, the more and more and I get older and it's, it's amazing, man. Exceptional, so. man. So Paul, where can people find you? Where can they connect with you? Learn more about you? Yeah. So you can actually connect with me at uh, Instagram, Paul Alex or the Paul Alex. And then also if you guys will want a free copy of my book, you could go to www.officialpaulalex.com backslash free book. Absolutely free book for you guys. There you go, guys. What better gift than to get your hands on his book? You've heard the story, but I'm sure there's some secrets in there that you can really use to kickstart your career and take your life to the next level, guys. Thank you so much for watching. And Paul, my man. Thank you, brother. It was a pleasure you, having you, brother. Thank you, Chris. Yes, sir. Yeah.